In this video, we'll cover the complete installation of a set of Wessel Nickel and Gross composite shanks and flanges, which are a considerable upgrade over comparable parts made from wood. A hammer shank has a rough life. When a pianist plays a note, the hammer accelerates at roughly five times the rate of the key. A wooden shank lacks the strength required to accelerate the hammer this rapidly and bends backward for a short period of time. The shank becomes a spring, capturing some of the energy of the blow. An instant later, the shank then whips forward, but not all of that energy is recovered. When a wooden hammer shank bends under its load, some of the energy that should actuate the strings is lost, dissipating into the fibers of the wooden shank as heat. Because of this, a wooden hammer shank is quite inefficient. A Wessel Nickel and Gross composite shank is very stiff and resists bending. Since less energy is lost, it's much more efficient than its wooden counterpart. Traditionally, wooden hammer shanks are larger in the base section and are smaller in the treble section. The larger base size provides the most efficient power transmission. On the other hand, the lower treble mass provides enhanced sustain. Traditionally, lower mass is achieved by tapering the hammer shanks in the tenor section and tapering them even more in the treble. Acoustically, these principles are still valid in a composite hammer shank. Wessel Nickel and Gross shanks use different wall thicknesses to achieve an ideal mass. To make installation as simple as possible, all of the shanks now have the same outer diameter. Wessel Nickel and Gross provides three different tubes in a set of hammer shanks for maximum power transmission, clarity, and sustain across the scale. In the base section, Wessel Nickel and Gross uses a tube diameter of 4.7 millimeters and a wall thickness of 1 millimeter in order to maximize power transmission for the larger hammers. In the tenor section, the same 4.7 millimeter diameter is used, but this time with a wall thickness of 0.8 millimeters. A tenor shank maximizes power transmission while also providing a transition to the lighter treble shanks. Treble shanks also use the same 4.7 mm tube diameter but have a 0.6 mm wall thickness. The lower mass helps to maximize sustain. Keeping the same diameter but gradually reducing the wall thickness means that only one hammer drill bit is required. Keep in mind that the bit used for Wessel Nickel and Gross shanks is smaller than the bits typically used for wooden shanks. As with any action work, good geometry is important. Wessel Nickel and Gross shanks feature a precision knuckle placement system. The knuckle location is measured from the shank's center to the center line of the knuckle. Notches in the shank allow the knuckle to be glued anywhere from 15 millimeters to 19 millimeters in half millimeter increments. For further precision, three knuckle sizes are also available. Knuckles with a diameter of 8 millimeters, 9 millimeters, or 10 millimeters allow for an ideal geometry in almost any piano. To make configuration even easier, Wessel Nickel and Gross sells pre-configured shanks and flanges. The sets work as standard replacements for many popular piano models. Each set includes a dimensionally correct flange and a shank with the appropriate knuckle location and diameter. All sets feature three tube sizes for optimum power and sustain. You'll need to determine which shank and flange configuration is best for your piano. If you happen to have a piano that matches one of the pre-configured sets, selection couldn't be easier. Before ordering, it's a good idea to confirm your selection by comparing the old part with the new part. The Wessel Nickel and Gross Sample Parts Kit includes shanks and flanges from many of the pre-configured sets.
Compare a shank and flange from your piano with the parts in the kit until you find one that matches. Confirm that the replacement includes the proper flange for your action rails, as well as an appropriate knuckle location and diameter. It's especially important to ensure that the new shank center pin is in the same location as the old one. If the shanks and flanges in your piano don't match one of the pre-configured sets, or if you want to alter your action geometry, you can order a custom set of shanks and flanges. Start by selecting a shank. Next, select a knuckle with the diameter that you wish to use. Then select a flange that will correctly position the center of the shank when mounted to the action rails. Once you've selected the correct shank, knuckle, and flange, a custom set can be manufactured just for you. And due to the extra work required for customization, custom sets are slightly more expensive and take an extra two or three weeks for delivery. Before installing the new shanks and flanges, you'll need to measure the location of the action centers. Plans for a simple, inexpensive center height gauge are available from Wessel, Nickel & Gross if you don't already have one. Wessel, Nickel & Gross provides an action breakdown sheet that can be downloaded from the website. The form offers a convenient and organized way to keep track of action parameters and measurements. Having the information in one place allows for better decision making when rebuilding an action. We'll use this sheet to record the center height measurements. Use the gauge to measure the height of the shank center. Place the key and action assembly on a good, flat regulating bench. Leave enough room at the end of the action for the center height gauge. Place the center height gauge on the table as close to the action frame as possible, with a block near the repetition rail. Bend the wire up or down until the tip is centered on the shank center pin. Once centered, rotate the pointer away from the action and measure the height with a ruler. Use a good quality decimal inch or metric ruler. If you're not using metric, we recommend a decimal ruler because it makes calculations easier. Measure the shank center height values for note number 1 and note number 88. Then, Record your measurements on the breakdown worksheet. Next, we'll use the center height gauge to measure the repetition center height. Place the center height gauge on the table as close to the action frame as possible with the block near the shank rail. Bend the wire up or down until the tip is centered on the repetition center pin. Once positioned, rotate the block away from the action and measure the height with a ruler. Measure the repetition center heights for note number 1 and number 88. Then, record your measurements on the breakdown worksheet. Next, we'll measure spread. Spread is the distance between the shank and the repetition centers. There are several ways to measure spread. Using a simple metric or decimal ruler is the easiest. With care, the readings can be very accurate. Place the ruler so that the number 1 aligns with the repetition center. Spread is the value at the shank's center with 1 subtracted. Measure the spread for note numbers 1 and 88 and record the results on the breakdown sheet. Using the measurements for shank center height, repetition center height, and spread, you now have sufficient information to make good decisions about the basic action setup. Now we'll start the teardown of the action. If you'll be using the old hammers as samples to position the new ones, number the old shanks before removing them. The numbers will allow you to find the correct trial shanks to use during reassembly. Remove the old hammer shanks from the rails. As the shanks come off, place the screws in a container so that they will be readily available during reassembly. Some rebuilders bead blast or otherwise clean the action screws while they're removed.
Many customers expect to see a new action, and rusty old screws don't leave a good impression. Rebuilders also sand dirt and age off the shank rail and replace the sandpaper. Some even apply a seal coat of finish to the rail. The seal coat improves appearance and increases stability during humidity changes. If you choose to apply a finish, pick urethane or another substance that doesn't become sticky with age. While shanks and flanges are the focus of this video, repetitions will typically be replaced at the same time. If you're also replacing the repetitions, clean that rail in the same manner as the shank rail. Metal case parts, such as the hinges and pedals, are often sent out for replating as part of the rebuilding process. Consider including the action brackets as well. Action brackets look quite nice with fresh nickel plating. By cleaning, finishing, or even replating the metal parts, a rebuilt action will look like new, in addition to working like new. Now that it's clean, you can reassemble the action frame. Remember, Wessel Nickel and Gross hammer shanks are reduced in mass from the base section to the treble. This is no different than the tapering you see in wooden shanks and is done for exactly the same reason. The shanks are color-coded for easy identification. On the bottom of each shank next to the knuckle, you will see a colored stripe. Red is for bass, white is for tenor, and blue is for treble. Shanks should be installed sequentially in each section. 90 shanks are included in a set, 30 of each type. On an 88-note piano, that leaves two spares. Simply leave off the extra two shanks. Mount the shanks to the rail and begin to tighten the screws. In most cases, you'll want to gently push each flange towards the front of the action in order to achieve consistent alignment. The shanks and flanges are mounted perpendicular to the shanks rail. Since you'll be traveling the shanks, only tighten the screws lightly at this time. Be careful when tightening the screws as it's easy to strip the holes in an action rail. Install the shanks in their appropriate locations spacing and squaring them to the front rail. This will make traveling easier. Shanks do not necessarily move in a true vertical direction when first attached to a hammer rail. An accumulation of tolerances from the surface of the rail to the center pin itself can slightly affect the alignment. These variances cause the shank to slant one way or another. Even a slight misalignment will cause problems later, so it's necessary to correct before gluing hammers onto new shanks. Place the top action on a flat bench. Set up a high contrast background so that you can easily see the motion of the shank in relation to a square. As you move an individual shank, you will see whether it's traveling parallel to the square. Traveling is achieved by placing paper shims under either side of a flange. This corrects the travel of the shank by slightly tipping the center pin. Observe which side a shank leans toward and place the paper shim under that side of the flange. We recommend using a square to travel every fifth shank in each section. You can do this with all the shanks if you prefer. However, most technicians find it too time-consuming to travel all the shanks with a square. Typically, samples are traveled with a square and the remaining shanks are traveled as a group. By combining the samples to a square method with section or group traveling, you can achieve good results in a reasonable amount of time. Next, we'll check the traveling by observing the motion of individual shanks in a group. Place a dowel under all the shanks in a section. Lift and lower the dowel to rotate the shanks through their normal range of motion. Misaligned shanks will stand out as you observe their motion in relation to properly traveled shanks. Use travel paper to correct any problem shanks. Now it's time to prepare the hammers.
there are several things that need to be done before hammers are glued onto shanks. First, hammers need to be bored. Wessel, Nickel, and Gross composite shanks have only one diameter, which is smaller than average. If you're boring the hammers yourself, you can purchase the drill bit directly from the Wessel, Nickel, and Gross website. If you intend to custom bore the hammers, the Wessel, Nickel, and Gross breakdown worksheet makes the process much simpler. If you're purchasing pre-drilled hammers, you'll need to specify a 4.9 mm hole diameter when ordering. If needed, Wessel, Nickel, and Gross will gladly supply any hammer vendor with the proper drill bit specifications and instructions. Hammers are typically tapered and prepared for checking before installation on hammer shanks. For more information about hammer tailing, please watch the Wessel, Nickel, and Gross back check video or refer to the manual. For alignment purposes, hammers that will be in the number 1, 72, and 88 positions must be marked with a center line. Draw a line on the side of the hammer from the tail to the tip. The line should be centered on the molding. CA glue is ideal for attaching hammers to shanks and should be used instead of white glue. Hammers must strike the strings at the correct distance from the agraph or capo de ostro bar for tonal reasons. The correct position is different for each piano, but is important to reproduce when replacing hammers. There are two methods used by rebuilders to position hammers. Some rebuilders will use the old hammers as a guide for new hammers. While not as precise, this method can work if the old hammers were properly aligned. But be careful, sometimes an action has been moved to optimize the sound at note 88. Other actions have keys that rub on a key slip, or sharps that hit the fallboard. If the action you're rebuilding has any of these characteristics, we do not recommend using the old hammers as a reference. On the other hand, if the alignment of the hammers was good, this is how you'd use them to align the new ones. After the new shanks are traveled, remove a shank one note away from the end of each section. Install the hammer that was previously in that position back onto the rail. Using the old hammers as guides, glue a new hammer onto the shank at the last note of each section. Once this is done, remove the old hammers and replace them with composite shanks. Using the old hammers as a reference does present some difficulties because new hammers are almost never physically the same as the old ones. Locating the new hammers requires some estimation. A better method is to set up samples as trial hammers, ensuring that they strike the strings in the correct locations. The rest of the hammers are then hung in a straight line between the trials. This method allows the rebuilder to correctly place the hammers, even if the old ones were aligned improperly. Starting with note number one, use masking tape and a felt pen to mark the location where the hammer strikes the string. The purpose of a trial is to position the hammers so that they strike the strings at the correct location. Set up trial hammers for note numbers one, 72, and 88. Use travel paper on the shank so that the hammer fits tightly. Friction will hold the hammer in place while you're finding the best location on the shank. The angle between the hammer and shank is called the rake angle. It is usually, but not always, 90 degrees. Make sure that the rake angle is correct for your trial hammer. Place the action with the trials in the piano and make sure that it's properly positioned in the case. Lift note number one with the hook and see how close it is to the mark on the string. If the alignment is off, you'll need to remove the action, move the trial, check the rake angle, and place the action back in the piano. It usually takes several tries before the alignment is correct. Now that the hammer is correctly positioned, Remove the action from the piano.
mark the location of the hammer and remove it from the shank. Apply glue to both the shank and the hammer. Slide the hammer back onto the shank, aligning it with the mark you made earlier. Check the hammer's position and verify that the rake angle is correct. Let the glue dry for a couple of minutes and then put the action back into the piano. Now verify that the freshly glued hammer is correctly positioned. If it isn't, use the Wessel Nickel and Gross hammer removal tool to remove the hammer and re-glue. It's not a good idea to reposition the hammer once the glue has started to dry. If the alignment is correct, remove the tape to avoid leaving residue on the strings. The Wessel Nickel and Gross treble strike gauge is used to locate the strike position of note numbers 72 and 88. Many rebuilders know that the distance hammers are located from the agraph, or capo bar, is a proportion of the speaking length. This is especially true in the bass section. It's the reason that locating note number one relies on finding where the old hammer hit the string. Because the speaking lengths are so much shorter in the treble section, the differences between pianos effectively disappear. That's why this tool works for all pianos at notes 72 and 88. Move note number 72's hammer with the hook, just like you did for the first note. Position the hammer with travel paper so that the tab on the gauge falls on the center line. Again, getting the proper alignment will likely take several tries. When the hammer is positioned correctly, mark its location on the shank. Like before, glue the hammer and verify the rake angle. Then place the action back into the piano and recheck the alignment. Repeat the same process for note number 88. Attach the remaining hammers to the shanks and align them using the method of your choice. Some rebuilders use a straight edge while others use a jig. The glue will set quickly but should still be given 24 hours to fully dry. Next we'll need to trim the shanks. Many rebuilders trim the shanks with toenail clippers designed for dogs. Do not use this technique on Wessel Nickel and Gross carbon shanks as squeezing the tubes will ruin them. Shop safety is important. Be sure to use a high quality dust mask when sanding the shanks. Clamp the hammer shanks together one section at a time. You will trim the hammer shanks, grind them flush, and round the hammer tails before moving on to the next section. Start by using the die grinder or dremel tool to cut off the excess shank material. The most obvious way to use the die grinder is to simply grind off the excess carbon tube. It's quick and easy. You can also cut the tube by using the edge of the disc as a cutter. After the tubes are cut down, grind the back of the hammer moldings flat and parallel to each other. This will allow more room for high checking. Now use a vacuum or compressed air to clean the dust out of the tubes. Hammer tail arcing leaves the bottom edge of the checking seat quite sharp. It's a good practice to round this edge so that the hammer tail doesn't cut the back check buckskin. You'll need to sand the tails to ensure a smooth finish. Using a sanding block with 100 grit sandpaper, sand with a curved motion at about a 45 degree angle. You'll want a radius of about 1 32nd of an inch or one millimeter on the edge of the hammer tail. It's rare to find a hammer job where side-to-side -side alignment is perfect. A heat gun or alcohol lamp is often used to heat the wooden shanks in order to allow for subtle corrections. When the shanks are hot, they become flexible, allowing the hammer to be moved to the correct orientation. The term for this task is widely referred to as burning the shanks. Wessel Nickel and Gross carbon shanks can also be burned, though a better term would be heated. A heat gun works well on composite shanks, but not an alcohol lamp. Do not use an open flame to heat composite shanks. 
The technique is essentially the same as with wood. Heat the tube from one end to the other by moving the heat gun continuously until the shank becomes pliable. Try to minimize heating the joint between the tube and the shank butt. When the tube becomes flexible, twist the hammer in the desired direction. Remove the heat from the tube and it will become abruptly stiff again. Unlike wood, there is no spring back. In many ways, heating the shanks is easier with composite than it is with wood. Only use this technique to correct side-to-side -side alignment and don't try to use it to correct the boring or rake angles. Now that the shanks and hammers are installed, the action should be fully regulated using standard procedures. Thanks for choosing Wessel Nickel and Gross Parts. Thanks for watching. For more information about Wessel Nickel and Gross, visit us on the web at www.wesselnickelandgross.com.